Oh, oh, Mr. No, Kaido, no, no, could you no, kindly no, please stop no, eating my subscribe no, button? No, my viewers no, need to no, click no, that no, in order no, to have regular One Piece content uploaded straight no, into their no, YouTube no, feeds. No, ah, you such a prick. No, no. Hello and welcome to the Grand Line Review, your source for everything One Piece. And today it's time to once again delve into the mysterious, or at the very least the uh, semi-mysterious, as we are going to examine some of the more intriguing devil fruits in the series that are currently hiding under the veil of the unknown. And that's because I spend a lot of time on this channel focusing on what we do know, and in fact I have an entire series dedicated to logging devil fruits that we have an abundance of information on, known as the Devil Fruit Encyclopedia. However, as part of my practice with that series, I do not examine fruits that are either unnamed or just plain unconfirmed to be devil fruits powers in general. And while I think that's for the best in that case, it is a bit of a shame because there are some incredibly crazy cool powers out there in the world that Oda has simply not chosen to completely reveal to us at the time of this recording. With some of them, we may have a pretty decent idea of their mechanics, whilst others seem like pure sorcery. And it's time to showcase these here today. As such, the criteria for this list is as follows. We will only be examining powers that have not been named or even confirmed to be Devil Fruit related. In regards to the latter, there does need to be a reasonable argument made that the ability is caused by a devil fruit, which I don't think will be a particular problem. Also, for the sake of making this fun and interesting, I've decided to exclude smile fruits because there's about, you know, a billion of them out there and most of them are pretty unknown, but I think they're a bit of a waste of time when there are much, much cooler things that we could be looking into. And finally, all unknown powers on this list must be canon because filler unknown powers should stay in the dark where they belong. But with that out of the way, let's begin. Welcome to the top five unknown devil fruits in One Piece. Number five. San Juan Wolf. All right, let's start this off with perhaps a bit of a shocking revelation for more casual One Piece fans, which is that yes, San Juan Wolf, also known as the Colossal Battleship, and now a Titanic captain of the Blackbeard Pirates, is indeed a known Devil Fruit user, although the name of said fruit is unknown. And this is one of those pieces of information that has come to light thanks to the One Piece Vivia Card data book, which actually has a whole ton of surprisingly important information. But in this case, we also happen to know roughly what this surely Paramecia fruit does as well, which is that it allows Mr. Wolf to grow in size and become one of the largest creatures this world has ever known. I mean, it's hard to judge him compared to things like Zanisha or the Thriller Bark creature, but I can tell you that San Juan Wolf can grow to at least the size of the entirety of Marineford and is said to stand at a height of 180 meters tall, which honestly I find a bit small given that he is supposed to be capable of standing on the ocean floor, the shallow parts, I suppose, because the true sea floor is like 10,000 meters below sea level. So uh, look, either way, he's a pretty big boy. Now what this devil fruit, known or not, does answer a question that fans have been asking for an awfully long time, which is how an individual of San Juan Wolf's size was even capable of being kept in Impel Down. And well, that's because without his powers active, he becomes a much more reasonably sized being, although he is still naturally massive and needed to be kept in a special large cell. This kind of devil fruit is also a mangaka's dream because assumedly, San Juan Wolf can have much more specific control of his size, meaning that Oda is free to be as inconsistent as he wants in regards to visually portraying him. Still, I am incredibly keen for the day to come when we delve into the details of this fruit in all its glory. Number four. Scratch Manapu. So here's a fruit I am very keen on exploring further because it's one of the more unique existences within the series, which allows its user to transform parts of their body into seemingly any musical instrument that they desire. And I find this to be particularly interesting because a lot of times devil fruits can be quite basic, almost naturally actually, in the way that they give their user a very primal ability, like Luffy who just becomes rubber, or Mr. Three who becomes able to generate and control wax. Whereas morphing your body into different complex creations that have taken the entirety of human history to reach, is a completely different endeavor. And it adds a lot of intrigue to the idea that devil fruits themselves were also very much man-made. That or they follow some bizarre psychological effect. So for example, if someone had eaten this unknown devil fruit a thousand years ago, then maybe they wouldn't have been able to craft saxophones or whatever else didn't exist back then. Like perhaps they would have been restricted to creating only what they knew of were musical instruments like harps and lutes and all of that sort of stuff. In any case, the One Piece Vivia card data book did confirm that Apu was a fruit wielder. Although I think that even without that, this is a case where we could have safely assumed because One Piece is home to some crazy non-Devil Fruit natural abilities, but there was no way that this was going to be one of them. And furthermore, it's obviously a Paramecia class fruit and capable of causing some pretty devastating damage as well, at least through the way that Apu uses it to produce his fighting music. I feel like it would be a really interesting matchup against someone like Brook, a sort of battle of the bands, if you will. But for now, both the name and true extent of this fruit's abilities will remain unknown, at the very least, at the time of this recording. Number three. 
Jewelry Bonnie. Keeping things within the worst generation for now, we move to Bonnie, who has long since been a source of mystery in regards to just about everything about her, and Bonnie's abilities are no exception. Within the series, she has demonstrated the incredible power of age manipulation, which she can apply to both other living beings as well as herself. And this unknown fruit just comes with questions. Oh, so many questions. For example, is the age manipulation permanent or does it have a specific time limit? And if it does have a limit, does that correlate to how long Bonnie touched someone or how much of a finite manipulation energy she used on them or any number of other factors. And if the age manipulation is permanent, then could that effectively make Bonnie immortal or at least perpetually youthful should she choose to invoke it? Or does her true body keep aging as per usual and eventually it will just succumb to old age regardless of Bonnie's exterior state? And the same goes for her victims as well. Could someone she turned into a child end up dying much earlier than their physicality would suggest? Or could an old man who looks 90 end up living another 80 years or so? Playing with time related effects in any way, shape or form just gets quite complex and it presents Bonnie as a potentially profound character as a result, with roughly a gazillion theories on the internet placing her at all points in the One Piece timeline, such as being the progenitor of the Charlotte family or even having lived during the Void Century. I personally rather doubt that either of those is the case, especially with the hints to her past being dropped during the Reverie arc. But the possibilities that this unknown fruit presents us with are numerous, and this is one that we really, really need explained. But for now, I suppose we can all just sit back and enjoy the mystery. Number two. Karasu. Oh, this is a strange power, and I'll straight up say that to my knowledge, it has not been confirmed anywhere at the time of this recording that Karasu is actually a Devil Fruit user. This is just one of those instances where we have to apply what we think is common sense, because the dude can turn into an entire murder of crows. And surely that's just not happening outside of a Devil Fruit, at least I hope not. The reason why I've put Karasu so high up on this list though, is because this is the first fruit, if it is indeed a fruit, where I don't think that we can make a solid judgment on what class it is. Honestly, there are arguments for all three. There is the potential that it is a Logia type fruit because in the series, Karasu has demonstrated a Logia type effect by being able to completely morph his body into the element of um, crows. And you know, maybe they're not crows. Maybe it's just some dark element that Karasu chooses to shape like crows in order to keep his thematic thing intact. Then again, if the crows are real, then maybe this fruit is a kind of bizarre Zoan type. Like instead of allowing its user to transform into a single animal, maybe it's another special subclassification that allows its user to become an entire group of creatures like this murder of crows that we've seen displayed. And that would also explain why Karasu seems to be able to communicate in crow form. But then again, it's also entirely possible that he is a Paramecia because weird fruits that don't easily fit the Logia or Zoan class always end up being lumped into the Paramecia section. But even then, it's just such a strange Paramecia because those fruits don't generally allow this sort of ridiculous bodily manipulation. So maybe a special Paramecia. But really, it does seem like a strange blend between a Logia and a Zoan, and I very much look forward to solving the mystery that is Karasu. But for now, there is still one more unknown devil fruit that I can't help but be curious about. Number one. Kaido. So I'd like to start by pointing out that at the time of this recording, yes, Kaido's devil fruit is still a mystery. That mystery will likely be solved very soon, but I really can't bring myself not to talk about it. The commonly accepted thought is that Kaido has eaten a mythical Zoan fruit that allows him to transform into an Eastern dragon, which yes, is fine. And if it were any other character, then that would be the obvious answer. But this is the strongest quote unquote creature in the world that we're talking about. And Oda has gone to great lengths in the series to make sure that Kaido has been identified as something other than human. And as ridiculous as this may seem, yes, that does call his devil fruit into question because it's entirely possible that dragon Kaido is the real Kaido and his more humanoid form is the result of another devil fruit. Perhaps something like a mythical devil fruit like the Hito Hito no Mi model Ogre. And I'll say that that's definitely quite unlikely and all of the evidence we have points to the dragon form being the devil fruit, but you can never predict the kind of crazy turns that One Piece will take. And even if we took the dragon form for granted, this insane fruit still has yet to be completely explained to us. Although it looks like by far the most powerful mythical Zoan introduced into the series thus far. However, I should also say that a lot of it may just be because the user just so happens to be the strongest creature in the world. The fruit itself may not be that overpowered. Uh, actually, I don't know, who, who am I trying to kid here? It is a mythical Zoan and it's going to be overpowered by default. But in any case, this unexplained devil fruit is always the first one I think of when the topic of unknown fruits comes up. And thus it shall top this list, at least for a very, very short while until it's sudden but inevitable revelation.
And that pretty much does it for the top 5 unknown devil fruits in One Piece. If you enjoyed this video and the content this channel produced in general, then please do consider donating to the Grand Line Review Patreon, because the support of all of you amazing people is what continues to make this channel possible. And if you'd like to see more videos like this but applied to other anime and manga series, then please do check out my second channel New World Review for all of your wider needs. And if you'd like to join the fun at any time, then please do head over to my Discord server, where a wide array of shenanigans takes place on a daily basis. And finally, please do comment with your own favourite unknown devil fruits in the series. Series. This has been the Grand Line Review, and I'll see you next time. Which one would you rather be master of, Haki or Nen? Ooh, very fun question here. So for anyone on this channel who isn't aware of what Nen is, it's the primary power system used in the series Hunter x Hunter, another property that I love to death and feature heavily on my second channel, New World Review. And to be perfectly honest, I'd have to choose Nen, and it's an entirely technical reason why. Because the fact is that there really isn't anything Haki can do that Nen can't. In fact, almost all major applications of Haki are forms of Nen use, like Armament Haki as general enhancement, and Conquer as Haki is easy to achieve just by learning the basic principle of Ren. Plus, Nen allows you to make all sorts of cool abilities, and honestly, I believe that it is the best power system in all of Shonen. So yes, I get that this is a One Piece channel, but in this particular case, I do have to choose Nen over Haki, simply because of phenomenal versatility. Will you make a video on One Piece World Seeker? Uh, look, probably not. I think the ship has sailed on that one. So fun short story, I did buy World Seeker the first day that it was released in Australia, and I had every intention of reviewing it on the channel, but to be honest, it was just a supremely discouraging game. I mean, all of the One Piece elements were really fun and cool to see, and it's great to interact with all the familiar characters, but it is just not a good open world game. Not at all. It is almost 100% fetch quests, and it has these game mechanics that absolutely infuriated me. The worst example of which was opening chests. Like get this, if you wanted to open a chest, you have to stand next to it, hold down a button until your gauge fills up, and then very, very eventually, you open it. And while you're holding the button, there's no animation or anything. It's just Luffy standing there, and it's such garbage because it makes me not want to open chests and therefore not bother exploring to find more chests because there's just no satisfaction in opening them like there would be in literally any other game because they take about 15 seconds each to open and the entire time you're just standing there doing nothing, like literal static screen. And that 15 seconds adds up every time. So if I want to open up four chests in an area, then that is a solid minute of just doing nothing in a game and it's so boring and infuriating because it stops the flow. And as you progress in the game, you can invest in a certain skill to open them faster, but ah, oh, what a waste. I mean, why should I have to invest heavily in a skill just to make a game playable from a quality of life perspective? Now that's just one example. Seriously, World Seeker is a joke. And I'm sorry if many of you out there love it. It's fun, but the fun comes from One Piece, not the actual gameplay. So in conclusion, I, uh, I probably won't be doing a video on it.